Praise the Lord. We give honor to the true and living God on this great day of worship. What a mighty God we serve, and he is truly doing great things in our lives, and we give his name the honor, praise, and the glory. His name is Jesus, amen. And if you haven't said his name all week, it is midweek, amen. We need to proclaim his name out loud. Jesus, in the name of Jesus, there is power, amen. And so we want to greet you this Wednesday night. Um, um, giving honor and glory to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We want to welcome you to Wednesday night Bible study. It's a great time for the saints to grow up in the things of the Lord. This is where you are formed and fashioned, and this is where we who are believers conformed into the image of Jesus Christ by way of his word, not gossip, amen, but by the way of his word, amen. And so we want to go back to our study. We've been in a great study dealing with um, some of the things we battle with. And one of the things we battle with as believers is that we can find ourselves being held hostage by things. And that's what we've been discussing in part six, how to overcome uh, this plague that has um, gripped the New Testament church, um, New Testament believers, this plague called materialism, getting caught up in stuff, amen? And we've been discussing um, us being held hostage by things, and it's so subtle that you and I can get caught up in, in the cares of this world, so much so that we forget about the things of eternity, amen? And so we want to go back into that. Jesus deals with uh, a serious, and he deals with an eternal issue, amen? And, and one thing about materialism, it's a, a spiritual, psychological um, problem, amen? And Jesus, as we're going to look at, we've been looking at him, his preaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is addressing in his message, which is the Sermon on the Mount, the fact that kingdom believers uh, are, are not, uh, should not be, I should say, should not be entangled with the affairs of this earth to such an extent, hold on to this, to such an extent that we forget about eternity. If you're a believer, we shouldn't be so wrapped up in this world, the things that we have, the possessions, that we forget all about things of heaven. We forget all about eternity, amen? And that's the problem that Jesus is dealing with in this sermon that he's dealing with, amen? Jesus deals with a serious and eternal issue with the Sermon on the Mount, amen? And, and the question is this. We've been discussing it for the last couple of weeks, five weeks. Where is your heart? Where is your heart as a believer? Where's your heart really, amen? Where is your concentration? Where is the occupation of your life? That's the issue that Jesus is dealing with, amen? As we look at the study text in Matthew, the sixth chapter, that's the study um, text for this whole um, lesson, Matthew 6, verses 19 through 34. Um, um, what is the object that you spend most of your time focused on, amen? Uh, what do you focus on? What are you thinking about? Where are you putting all your energy and time into? And that's what Jesus is dealing with with this sermon out of Matthew, the sixth chapter. Uh, where is your heart? Now, let's understand something. Jesus, he told 38 parables in the Gospels. Now, watch this. Let me show you how uh, important this issue is. The issue of, of money, the issue of possessions, how important it is to the Lord, amen. He, uh, he um, um, told us, uh, he spoke to 38 parables in the gospel, but out of the 38 parables that Jesus dealt with, 16 of the parables is about how to handle money, and it revolves around possessions and money, amen. He talks more about, watch this, Jesus talks more about possessions and money and things and stuff more so than heaven and hell. I want you to get that. That's how important it is, amen? Important it is to God, amen? The way that we handle it, the way that we view it, uh, it reveals, watch this, our eternal perspective, but watch this, get this teaching. This teaching is so provocative because this teaching that Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount, it also reveals our eternal destiny. Watch this, it reveals your heart, amen? That's why Jesus says in Matthew 6, 21, where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. And watch this class, where your heart is, it's going to reveal your treasure. And that's eternal. That's an eternal perspective, amen? That also shows forth, shows forth eternal destiny. So as we go back to this, I want to go back and I want to reintroduce you to a couple that I introduced you to about five weeks ago. And I want to reintroduce you to uh, Mr. and Mrs. Thing. Y'all remember them? 
uh, Mr. and Mrs. Thing. Amen. I think we might have forgot about Mr. and Mrs. Thing. Now, as we look at this, you got to remember they're pleasant folks, they're successful folks, but they measure their success. Grab this class. They measure their success with a thing o meter, the things that they have. And a lot of folks in society, even in the church, are measuring their su success by what they possess. Amen. And they measure their success by a thingometer. Uh, watch this. Remember what I told you? They love setting down on, on, on nice things. They love very expensive things. They focus on things to set on, things to cook on, things to ride in, things to eat. They, they, they focus on shiny things, new things, um, 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 things to wear, things to watch. They focus on things that they can um, put in their yard, amen. They, they focus on things that uh, um, revolve around long, hot summers. They also focus on things that revolve around short, cold winter um, nights, amen. And they love playthings and, and they love things, amen. That's remember Mr. and Mrs. Thing, amen. They love things, amen, possessing more and more stuff. Remember this couple? And so as we look at this, and understand this, watch this, understanding that this whole thing of the sinful heart of man is egged on by selfishness, amen? The sinful heart of man is egged on by selfishness. And watch this, and selfishness attaches itself, grab this rooted, selfishness, we don't want to re receive this, but selfishness attaches itself to products, amen? It becomes greed. Self-destruction is the end, amen? The curse of society has created um, um, creatures that are committed to things more so than creatures that are cre um, committed to the creator. Let me say that again. Society has so fashioned people that now creatures are now committed to things more so than creatures, which are we, we're creatures, being committed to the creator. And that's what we've been dealing with, this whole thing of being caught up by possessions. Amen? Uh, uh, and, and let's get started. Amen? Let's get started. I never shared with you, and that's what we're going to do, a, a, another look today. I never shared with you what held Mr. and Mrs. Thing captive. There, there, there's something that holds them captive, and it's something that holds you and I captive. Even as believers, we can find ourselves getting caught up in our homes, our, our possessions, our vacations, our, the stuff of life, so much so that, that Jesus is no longer on the throne. We got a lot of folks like that, that Jesus is no longer sitting on the throne. So what is, what is, what are, what are the, what is the thing that, that holds us captive? What are some of the... Um, um, things that, that hold us captive to materialism. And I want to share with you this evening three thugs, three thugs that, that, that work for materialism. I'm going to share with you three things that can hold you and I, that can move in our lives, that can uh, uh, allow us to be held hostage by things. Three thugs that we want to identify. And materialism employs three thugs. Get that three thugs, I said, to work for it. Amen? And there is, and that's their job. The job of these three thugs is to hold us hostage by building blocks, building blocks in our minds. We've talked about this before, called strongholds. A lot of folks are caught up in materialism because they're strongholds, impregnable castles located where? And our thought life, amen. And these three thugs, that's their job, amen. Their job is to is to is to work through all this, amen, and to hold us hostage to these things. So watch this. Let's look at the first thug. Let's understand something. I want you to turn your Bibles. Look at Matthew in the book of Matthew. We exegeted in Matthew. If you've been studying with us, uh, um, Jesus dealt in Matthew six. He went from nineteen, verse nineteen, all the way down to verse 24 that we looked at. Remember, from Matthew 6, 19 through 24, he was talking about dealing how to deal with luxury. Remember the two, the two things? He was dealing with two visions. Remember, two masters, two treasuries. Remember that in the exegesis. Now, watch this. In, in Matthew 6, 25 through 34, Jesus is now going to deal with necessities. Get that. Amen. 
he's now dealing with necessities. He's now dealing with the things that we need to live on, amen, and necessities, amen. And so watch this. Look at this. As we look at this, he shares with us in verses 24, 25 through 34, powerful promises, amen, powerful promises come straight from Jesus, amen, and, and, and they're literally, they're infallible truths. These are, this is an infallible truth that Jesus is going to share with us. Look what he says here. Look at this. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. It's not life more than food and the body more than the clothes. Look at the birds of the air. Do they not sow or reap or store away in barns? And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. This is the point that Jesus wants to make. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? Listen to what Jesus said. Why are you worrying about this temporal stuff? Clothes. See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spend. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon, and we know that Solomon is the richest, the richest man that ever li lived, amen? Solomon, in all of his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothed the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. Now, we're going somewhere tonight. So do not worry, saying, what shall, we, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For, the thing, for pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows what you need, that you need them. But seek, here we go, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry, here he goes again, about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen. Here we go. So Jesus, he, he gives us something. Before I get you into this thug, watch this. He gives us a powerful promise. Amen. An infallible truth. He's letting us know, watch this. First, God is the one who will provide all of your necessities. Watch this rooted Bible. God takes care of all your needs. All your necessities, God says, I got you. Amen. I'm the creator. I formed you. I formed everything that you see. I got you. Anything that you stand in need of, I, I'm able to provide for your necessities. Amen. But God also has promised to meet all the needs. Amen. Watch this. To meet all the needs. Right. And God has promised to meet all of our needs. Now, as you understand this, some people say, well, if God meeting all the needs, why are some folks starving? If God says this, that he clothed the lily of the field and, 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 and he feeds the, the fowl of the air, the birds of the air, then if we look out in the world, we see people starving. Well, that's not God. That's the sinfulness of man. Make sure you understand that. Because everybody want to put this bad press on God. It, God says, I provide food for everyone. But it's the sinfulness of man that robs man from getting all that God has for man to receive, amen? It's the sinfulness of man, amen? And, and so as we look at this and understand this, the first statement, let's look at the first thug. The first thug that we want to identify is this thug of discontentment. The first thug that comes into our existence, tries to rob us and hold us hostage, that we get caught up in stuff and materialism and we want more Amen. And it takes our eyes off of Jesus, takes our eyes off the kingdom of God is because the thug of discontentment is robbing our lives. We're discontented. Amen. And so we have to understand that this thug discontentment is a con is a conduit which leads to materialism. If you are a discontented Christian, you're going to find yourself caught up in stuff, getting more stuff, materialism, hoarding, selfishness. Amen. Because the thug of discontentment is robbing your life. Amen. I want you to understand that. Amen. Folks that are always discontented are prime candidates for materialism. If you're walking around and you're not satisfied, amen, you are a prime candidate to get caught up in materialism. Amen. You got to walk with me. Amen. And so watch this. Let me give you a spiritual definition. Let me give you a spiritual definition that goes alongside with this discontentment. How we as believers can find ourselves 
always discontented. Amen. And let's look at it. The first thug, the first thug. Amen. It's a spiritual definition. Watch this. Not being, grab this definition. I think it's up on the screen. Not being content or satisfied in the place, the position, or with the possessions that God, this is the key word, has sovereignly designed for us. Don't you know that God has already sovereignly designed a plan for your life? Everything you're going to get, God has already planned it. He's already designed it. He's already moved in it. God controls all things. Everything that he has for you is already stored up for you in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so at times we can find ourselves becoming discontented over what God has sovereignly already called or ordained in our lives. Amen. And I'm talking about right now in the space of time. That's the definition. Amen. That you and I become discontented. Maybe the house is not big enough. Amen. But he's given us the house or maybe the car is not new enough. Amen. And we can find ourselves becoming discontent or maybe watch this. I have I have 20 pair of shoes, but but I need 30 pair of shoes, whatever it is. We can find ourselves not being content over the sovereign rule of God in this particular time in space in time in our lives amen and we can find discontentment and we're not satisfied we're not satisfied over what the Lord has given us in the place that he's given us in the position that he has given us can I get an amen so as we look at this we see that discontentment operates like this and when there's discontentment walk with me it's a thug it's a thug discontent when it walks like this it allows our soul when you're discontented watch this grab this Write this down somewhere. When you and I are discontented over a lot in our lives, in the season that we're in, watch this. It's our souls that begin to call the shots in our lives and not the Lord ordering our steps. We're going by our feelings more so than what God ordains for us in that specific time and season in our life. We're going by how we feel. That's why we find ourselves getting caught up in credit card debt and all kinds of stuff and, and getting more stuff. And why? Because we find ourselves being controlled by our souls instead of being led by God's spirit. You better get that. Amen? Because discontentment is a thug. Amen? Discontentment will rob us. Amen? And not only that, our emotions will override spiritual truth and reasoning amen when you're discontented your emotions will override what truth is and will and watch this and what is reason saying amen your your emotions will override that amen and why because we want satisfaction why because we want to now we want satisfaction from this discontentment that is now in my life amen amen and so watch this as we look at this and then thirdly the, the discontentment is always seeking and this is key Discontentment is always seeking inner fulfillment and peace from something or someone outside of God. Anytime you're looking for peace and contentment and fulfillment outside of God, you're going to find yourself in a bad place. I'm going to tell you that right now. Amen. Because nobody can fill that void. Nobody can fill that space in your life except the Lord. He's the satisfier of souls. If you got Jesus, I'm telling you right now, you got everything. Amen. He satisfies those, those inner feelings. He satisfies the fulfillment of one's life. So we have to understand this. Amen. And if you're searching uh, outside of the Lord, you're going to find yourself getting caught up in stuff, materialism, things that you can touch and feel instead of in the person who can dwell and take over your life, amen? And so as we look at this, we are looking at uh, this whole thing of the, of, 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 of the first thug, which is discontentment. Now watch this. Discontentment, the working components, there's some working components that fuels discontentment. There's some working components, I'm gonna give them to you. And it leads to materialism. There's something that King Solomon says. I write this down on your proof text, in your outline. Amen. Go to the description in the bottom and hit and get yourself an outline out of the description um, um, box in the, in the bottom and get you an outline. The working components which fuels discontentment. What are some of the things that can fuel my discontentment? What are some of the things that, that, that can come into my life that can get me caught up in my stuff, my possessions, more so than the things of heaven? Well, 
listen before we look at that in the book of Ecclesiastics, chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. Listen to a man uh, 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 with godly wisdom, because God gave him godly wisdom, because that's what he asked for. But also earthly experience, listen what King Solomon says. Everyone toil is for their mouth. Everyone's toil is for their mouth. Listen what he says here. Yet their appetite is never satisfied. Amen. Eating but never getting fulfilled, never, never filling your appetite, never satisfied. What advantage have the wise over fools? And what do the poor gain? By knowing how to conduct themselves before others, better what the eye sees, better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless. And what he is talking about here, he's talking about a person that is never satisfied person that's never you're not satisfied watch this lord didn't brought you a long way he didn't bless you he didn't open up doors but you still ain't satisfied he didn't give you that job that you wanted amen bless you uh you you making six figures but you ain't satisfied with that you want you want even more than that and i know we got this new movement in society talking about gain get your grind on and getting all you can get but watch this it's something when you're getting it all about selfish desires and it's not fulfilling god's eternal plan Amen. And so there are some working components. And the first component that fuels discontentment is the cloud and it's the, it clouds the decision making process. When you are discontent, watch this, you can't make proper decisions. It clouds your decision making when it comes down to finances, when it comes down to making the right moves, because discontentment has a way of clouding um, our decision making. Amen. Amen? It clouds it. And so we can find ourselves making decisions that we shouldn't be making, doing things that we shouldn't be doing, carrying us places that we shouldn't be going to. Amen? And so discontentment clouds the decision-making process. Think about that. Amen? I want what I want, but what my eye sees at this time, my money may not be able to handle it, but my eye sees it. And we can make ourselves, the decision that we're making is making bad decisions. Amen? But secondly, the second component that ties into discontentment is that it is never satisfied. It is never satisfied. It ain't satisfied with a mate. It ain't satisfied with, with the woman or the man that God has given you. Amen. It's not satisfied with the job that, that God has given you. It's never satisfied. It's not satisfied, like we said, with the salary. You haven't even learned how to work uh, 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 the 50 grand, but you're looking for the 100 grand, but you haven't been faithful over the 50 grand. It is never satisfied over salary. It's never satisfied over what you ride. It's never satisfied where you live. Uh, the furniture we complain we want more because discontentment is never satisfied and you'll find yourself grumbling upset unstable in the state of, of of your being amen and so we see some of the components that fuel discontentment we're talking about materialism we're talking about some of the uh, psychological things and spiritual things that that come against us but then third component write this down third component discontentment has a lack is a la shows forth a lack of patience one of the components that fuel discontentment is that we don't have no patience we can't wait on the lord we don't know how to wait for our change to come we want what we want now i gotta have it now amen it's hasty we make hasty decisions why because it lacks patience don't you know that things take time and, and God moves in some areas in our lives that we're not ready for, some things we can't handle right now. We think we can handle it, but we lack the patience. And one thing about mankind, mankind don't want to wait. We don't want to wait. We want what we want it, and we want it now. And so one of the components of discontentment is that it lacks patience. It lacks patience, amen? It don't want to wait. But then the fourth component, discontentment is a big one it distorts the view of God amen it distorts the view of God and what I mean is that it tries to control God discontentment tries to control God discontent will try to make God place God under itself amen and so discontentment distorts the view of God it changed God so it wants so that now God will meet my wants and meet my needs, amen? No longer is it faith, amen? 
but it's all based on what I want. It's no longer a walk of faith. It's no longer me trusting God. But, but what it does, it reduces God to a statue or, or a, a status of being a heavenly, a heavenly ATM machine. Amen. And we got a lot of folks that think that God is an ATM machine. Amen. That's all they talk about, how God can bless me how God can give me more, amen? But God is not an ATM machine, amen? And what discontentment does, it distorts the view of who God is, amen? Now, God don't give you everything that you want, amen? All your, everything that you want or everything that you um, think that you should have. No, because he loves you more than that, amen? And so we have to understand it distorts the view of God. But then discontentment, the fifth thing of the component, it takes matters into his own hand. Write that down. When you're discontented, watch this. You don't care what nobody say. You want to take matters into your own hand. And some of us have, have gotten caught up in a bad way because we didn't, we were discontented, not satisfied, and we happen to take matters into our own hands. Amen? Amen. We, we want to do what we want to do. Amen? And it goes outside of what God has for us. It goes outside of what is even feasible. Amen. A lot of people right now are in debt. Why? Because they wanted to go, they took matters in their own hand. Some people are in situations now that we shouldn't even be in. Why? Because we took matters in our own hands instead of trusting and waiting on the Lord. So discontentment has these different components that fuels it. Amen. Amen. Has these different components that fuels. Hopefully, hopefully you got that. Amen. Let me share with you some scripture here. And, and, and look at this as we look at it. In John um, chapter 6, verse 26, watch what Jesus says here. Jesus answered, and this is uh, after he done fed the multitude. He says, verily, verily, I tell you, you're looking for me. This goes back to us um, distorting the view of God. We think God is what we want him to be. Amen. Um, Jesus answered, verily, truly, I tell you, you're looking for me, not because you saw the signs that I perform, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. What Jesus says, you only following me because you think you can only get what you can get from me. And we got a lot of folks like that. Amen. A lot of folks think they're only going to um, follow the Lord so they can get all that they can get from God. Amen. And we got a lot of selfish people like that. What can I get from you? Amen. Don't want to serve the Lord. Don't want to love the Lord. Don't want to don't want to give back into the kingdom of God. But they always want to extract from him and have a distorted view of who he is and think that his job is just to give them everything that their hearts desire. Amen? And so we have to understand it. But look what he says in John 16, chapter 16, verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me, look what Jesus says. This is where, you, this is where discontentment falls by the wayside when you're always discontented. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Peace is in Christ. Peace is not in a new car or, or more money because you make more money don't mean you got no peace. I know a lot of folks that got a lot of money in mansions, they ain't got no peace, amen? But he says, but it's in me. You may have peace in this world and you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus says, watch this, your peace, your satisfaction is found in the Son of God. That's where the peace is. Don't you know you may not never be a millionaire, but your peace is in Jesus. The salvation, the love, and the mercy that he's bestowed upon us, that's the peace that God has given us. Amen? But then thirdly, watch this. In John 15, verse 11, I have told you this to that my joy. This is Jesus again. Talking about joy. Real joy. Eternal joy. Not joy because you got a mink coat. Not joy because you're able to go on a, cru a cruise. Praise the Lord, you're able to do it. But true joy comes from Jesus, the Son of God. God, amen? And he says, I've told you this so that my joy may be where? In you. And your joy may be complete. Did you see that? What are we talking about? See, we got to understand that true satisfaction is in the Lord. We got, we got some folks looking for a mate. You think you're going to get totally satisfied by a husband and wife. A wife and a husband will not totally satisfy you. It's great that God has given us helpmates. No, your total satisfaction is in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's your total satisfaction. Amen. You're going to always find yourself wanting if he's not first. Amen. And so as we look at this, we have to understand that this is uh, uh, satisfaction is in the Son of God. Now watch this. As we come down, there's... 
the hostage breaker from this. How do we break away from this discontentment? Discontentment seeks out uh, 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 by trying to fill our lives, but how do we now change this thing? And somebody might be thinking, well, Pastor, I got you, but how do I change this thing? How do we, how do we change this thing? How do we uh, change this thing that now I'm not so caught up in the object and, and things and the creative things, but true contentment, how, how do I get it back that my true contentment, first and foremost, is in a person? Amen? And I just gave you some of them scriptures. Amen? The hostage breaker, amen, from discontentment, watch this. Is learning, grab this, and embracing truth. We need some folks that now will learn and embrace God's word. That's what breaks the, this thing on materialism, breaks this thing like Mr. and Mrs. Thing, that we got folks caught up in their stuff, that their eyes are no longer on focus on things of eternity. They so caught up in, in their homes and so caught up in what they possess and all that and the money in the bank that they can't even see Jesus. What breaks that? What breaks that? That the, uh, the breaker from discontentment is learning and embracing some truths. Amen. In the book of Philippians 4, amen, you get a chance, turn that in Philippians 4, 11 through, verses 11 through 13, real quick, watch this. Let's read it real fast, and then I'm going to give you four things before we close. Because somebody needs to hear this. Amen. Church needs to wake up. We need to get back to having an eternal perspective. Where's your heart? Amen. It's nothing wrong with having nice, it's nothing wrong with these things. But there's something wrong, remember, when these things got you so much that Jesus is no longer on the throne. His kingdom is no longer of importance, that everything is about self. Everything is about being self-absorbed. We got folks, the Lord and blessed with $100,000 a year or more on the job and can't even give back to the kingdom, can't do nothing for the Lord. There's a problem with that. There's a problem with that with Jesus, amen, because he's been good to us, amen. Look what it says here. Look what it says in Philippians 4 and 11 through 13. It says this. It says, and I'm saying, and I am not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content. Whatever the circumstance, I know what it is to be in need. Look what Paul says. And I know what it is to have plenty. I've been birthed, and I know I've been there before. Uh, First lady and I, we, I remember a time we had nothing at all. Amen. Uh, I'm getting uh, hand-me-downs. I don't know if y'all remember that. Getting stuff from other people. Uh, uh, get, getting a bed that someone else don't want no more. I'm um, getting a sofa that somebody don't want to use no more. Y'all remember those days? And then God is so good. Then He give us to a day of plenty that now we're able to go into the store and get what we need to get by the grace of God. Amen. We thank the Lord. So Paul says, I know what it, need, what, it, what it means to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. And I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. If I, if I can't go to the store to get what I want to get, that's all right. That's all right. If I can't buy that brand new car that I want, no, that's all right. That's all right. I've learned how to be in either situation. Amen. I've learned how to eat steak, but at the same time, I learned how to delight myself in a bologna sandwich. I've learned how to, as long as I put it in the frying pan, get a little, I'm going to I'm I'm fry that, I'm gonna fry that bologna. Amen. And I've learned, and whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, watch this. I can do all this through him. I can do all things. Why? Why? Because my contentment is not based on stuff. It's not based on where I live and, and how much money I got in the bank. No, it's based on him. And so that's what Jesus is teaching us. And so watch this. The contentment is based on him. And so let me give you four things as we roll. Let me give you four truths that you and I need to grab onto because we need to break this thing. We got a lot of church folks all about themselves. It's all about me, myself, and I, what I have. What about the kingdom of God? What about the kingdom of God? What about all that the Lord has placed in our hands? Are you investing back into his kingdom, into ministry, into people's lives, and, 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 to, and to evangelism? How are you giving back? Where's your perspective? Four things real quick. The first thing, how do we get back to this perspective as believers? The first truth is this. you got to understand ownership. You have to understand ownership, amen? And ownership is this, write that down, the first truth. You got to understand who owns it all. He owns everything, Rooted Bible. 
everything, everything that you have belongs to him. Everything. I'm, when I say everything, watch this. When we leave this earth, watch this. Even, even the suit or the dress that's in that casket belong to him. Amen. Everything. Amen. And so we have to understand Look what he says in 1 Chronicles 29, 11. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth. Watch this is yours. This word of contentment. This is where we start breaking down this discontentment. It's all his. Amen. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You're exalted and head over all. This is where we start to break down and learn how to be satisfied. When I recognize that everything belongs to him. I don't know about y'all wake up every morning, I say, thank you. Thank you, Lord. To be, to be, to wake up in a bed, thank you, Jesus. I thank you. Amen. To be walking, to be able to cut on some air or some heat in the wintertime, thank you, Lord. Why? Because everything belongs to him. Amen. And so ownership, if we, uh, as, as believers, if we believe for one minute that we own a single possession, then that possession will govern our spiritual attitude. If you think that you own it, it's going to change you. It's going to change your spiritual attitude. And that's what we got. We got a lot of folks, you think that you own it. And so it changes your spiritual attitude towards the things of God. Amen. It changes that. Amen. And so we understand that. Uh, 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 real quick, quick story, real quick. It was a, a gentleman and, and he got stuck in this tragic. He got stuck on the train track and on the train track and the train was coming. This is a true story. And the people was telling him to get out the car. They kept saying, get out the car. This happened years ago in Harford County. They said, kept saying, get out the car. And they said, why wouldn't he get out the car? He kept trying to start the car, start the car, until the train hit the car, and he perished in the car. You know why? Because for uh, that time, he thought that car was his. See, if you understand that that car is not yours, you're going to jump out that car and say, Lord, there goes your car down the track with the train. That's not my car. Amen. He didn't, he thought it was his car, so he died in that car because he thought it was his. Watch this, second truth, that God is the controller and the, and the distributor of all things. He distributes all things. This is where you break down discontentment, amen? Look, go back to the text. Look what it says in 1 Chronicles 29, 12, amen? Wealth and honor come from you. That's why I can't get jealous what someone else has. If they, they make more money or got a big, that's, that's God's business. That ain't my business. And I ain't trying to keep up with the Joneses. That means you're not satisfied. Amen. Wealth and honor come from you. And you are the rule of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. God is the one who distributes. Amen. What he wants to give Pastor Webb, what he want to give you, whatever. Amen. God is the one. He controls that. Amen. And we have to learn that. And that's when we'll learn not to hold on to stuff so tightly. Amen. That he is the one who distributes. Not only does he own everything, but he controls and hand outs and in his pre, watch this, get this theological word, and his predetermined counsel. God has a predetermined counsel that he had in your life and my life before we was even born. It was a predetermined counsel. Amen. And so we have to understand this. Amen. And so we get that. And this is what breaks down discontentment. But the other thing, third thing, real quick, Hashi's breaker, amen, from discontentment, amen, is that he is the provider. God provides. I don't know about you. I'm so thankful that I serve a God who provides. Amen. He provides. Amen. In Genesis 22, 14, it gives us this. It says, so Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And we're dealing with Abraham and his son Isaac. And he says, God going to make a way. God's going to have a ram in the bush. Don't worry about it. No matter what you see, what you don't see, God's going to make a way. God in his providence, he's going to provide. Amen. In his providence. Amen. God will make a way. And brothers and sisters, I just want to let you know today, discontentment is torn down when you understand that God will provide. He will provide. Amen. David says, I'm old. Um, but I was once young, and I never seen the righteous forsaken, never, nor his seed begging bread. Hit that today, that God is the provider. I don't know about you, I get excited thinking about it, amen? And that turns down this, this, this hostage breaker, this thug called discontentment, amen? Discontentment can't hang around when I understand that he owns it all, that he controls and distributes it all, and that he provides. But then lastly, 
And let's close with this. Amen. The fourth truth. Amen. Is that God is meeting your needs. God is meeting your needs. Amen. It may not be the way that you want it, but he's meeting your needs. Amen. Amen. For if you got a morsel of bread or uh, uh, some cool water to drink, you should be thankful. God is meeting your needs. Amen. And, and Philippians 4 and 19 says, and my God, my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. God never promised to give us all of our wants. He never did that. There's nowhere in scripture where God has promised to give us all of our wants. Amen. Amen. But he said, I will take care. That's what he says in Matthew 6. He says, if I, if I take care of the birds of the air, amen, if I clothe the flowers of the field, how much more will I do for you? Amen. You're made up in my image. So what does that do? That tears down this discontentment. The spirit of, 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 of wanting more or not being satisfied in the place that God has. You need to learn how to be satisfied. Where the place where God has you, the station he has you in life, and wait for God to give you the increase. Amen? We're done. Amen? And so we're looking at the first thug that fuels materialism, and that is, watch this, the thug of discontentment. If you're discontented, then you're going to find yourself getting caught up and taking your eyes off of the prize and getting your mind off of heavenly things, your mind's going to be so involved with earthly things. Why? Because you're not satisfied. Amen? You never got to this place of satisfaction, and then you can't advance God's kingdom on this earth because you're so caught up with this spirit of discontentment that you want more and more. Watch this. For yourself. Receive that teaching tonight. Amen. We're going to come back next week. We're going to look at the second thug. I'm not even going to tell you who he is, but he's a bad boy. You better come in next week. You've seen the first thug. Let's get him out of the life. Amen. And we're going to identify the second thug next week. May God bless you. Maybe one here tonight that stands in need of this great salvation. Jesus, the lover of our souls, came into this world to give his life a ransom for many. He went to the cross and paid the sin debt in full and we're justified freely by his grace not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saves us through the working of the renewing and the regeneration of his spirit amen is there one here tonight that stands in need you're listening you're on in tv land you're listening and you said i must uh, come to this place of surrendering and I recognize I'm a sinner and I stand in need of a savior. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. That you can confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. The Bible says, thou shalt be saved. Is there one? Call that number on the screen. If that's you, let somebody know that you've given your life to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. May God bless you. Look forward to seeing you on Sunday, Father's Day. We're asking all the dads to come on out, get a word that's going to challenge you, build you up, and keep you running a little bit longer. Amen. And holding up the bloodstained banner. So come on up. we we'll see you on Sunday. May God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. Be blessed.